Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by Rick Brunt from the Health and Safety Executive. Um, I'll be getting him to introduce himself in a second, but just uh, quickly to run through with you our usual webinar housekeeping. Um, those of you who are new or our uh, uh, people who are joining us for um, the second or third time. Um, you'll see on the right hand side, there's a chat panel. Please use that to chat to each other, to introduce yourselves, to exchange some tips and ideas. And it's great to see so many of you doing that already. Um, you'll see that underneath the screen here, there's a green button that says view with live transcript. You can uh, click that button if you want to view uh, live captions of what we're saying, that will open the webinar in a new window where you'll be able to see us and see the transcript. But if you do that, please remember to close this original window down, otherwise you'll get a bit of echo. Um, there is an ask a question button also at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can post any questions there for Rick and we'll try to get to them uh, after the main bit of the webinar. Um, we probably won't be able to get to all of them, but we will try to get through as many as we can. But don't worry, we do take all questions in uh, in hand and we, we use it to inform our advice that we give you, our, our workplace union reps. So I'm just gonna get Rick to introduce himself before we get going with the main presentation. Over to you, Rick. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm absolutely delighted to be here to talk with you this afternoon. Um, as Anna said, my name is Rick Brunt. I am Head of Operational Strategy at HSE. Um, I may have met some of you in the past, I don't know, but I have been in HSE for over 30 years. I've worked as an inspector, as a regulator pretty consistently in that time, working across industries from agriculture, manufacturing, gas safety. Um, I've worked on training inspectors. I've worked on our training programs. Head of operations and now in strategy. So I'm hoping I've got the breadth of experience that will help me answer the questions you've got today. Thank you, Anna. Thanks, Rick. Uh, before we get going with um, some of the questions that we've prepared for Rick in advance, and some of these questions are based on uh, things that you have been posting for us in the run-up to this webinar, um, I think it's important to say that some of the rules in the nations are different. Uh, but it's not the same in Scotland and Wales as it is in England. And reps who live in Wales and Scotland should check their own government websites. Um, and in fact, the HSC website directs in this way. So you can look there. There, but do remember that it might that there are different uh, there are different rules and regulations. So, first question, Rick: uh, What have been the HSE's top three priorities during the COVID nineteen pandemic? Right, I think we probably had more than three, but the top ones, obvious one, is we needed to work with government and with business to help them understand the risks of COVID and to manage those in the workplace. So we've been heavily involved in developing guidance with Bayes and other government departments for keeping workplaces safe. We've done a lot of work with the health service um, in relation to provision of PPE for healthcare workers. That's been a very, very big work stream. And then, of course, um, we've still had a lot of business as usual because people are still going to work and still exposed to their normal workplace risks. And we've had to be able to help and advise in that way. Now, we've done all of that within a backdrop of us as an employer um, and as a workforce having to also move with the rules of COVID and working at home and, you know, staying safe and reducing travel. So there's been a real balancing act of bringing those things together and adopting to a much more virtual world. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure lots of our viewers today um, may be watching from home. Um, or at least maybe were working from home in previous weeks of the pandemic. Um, so can you talk us through the risk assessment process for workplaces preparing to return? Uh, we know that some places have already returned, but um, they may, uh, some may still yet to be to do that. So if you could talk us through that process, please, that would be great. Yeah. I think the first thing I'd say is rely heavily and call heavily on the government guidance that's being produced, not just in England, but also Wales and Scotland, because what we've recognised is that most workplaces understand their normal risks 
if you're a factory, you know your risks of your machinery and your transport and so on. COVID is one that very few people have ever experienced before. So the risk assessment process is what sits behind that guidance. So you're thinking about how do we go about redesigning the job with the principles of social distancing and cleanliness and hygiene. So I think that's one of the most important points to make is applying those principles first and foremost uh, is the critical part. If you can't keep people apart, how currently how do you redesign your workplace to do that if you're a customer facing business how do you manage the flow of your customers to help you do that so that risk assessment process is the same as any others identify the points at which something could happen take action to reduce the likelihood uh, i think you also asked there about whether or not the um, publishing risk assessments um, how that comes into play and the guidelines that have been published by government um, do suggest that risk assessments are published. The legal requirement, obviously, as many people on this call will know, is that an employer shares the key findings with their workforce. So there is no legal obligation in publishing them. But if you're looking at keeping your workforce engaged, keeping people confident in what you're doing, then to be able to share it more publicly is a really good step forward um, to be able to help that and help with employee confidence. Uh, that's all really useful. Thank you, Rick. Um, but do you think that um, as well as the risk assessment process, what other steps should employers be taking to ensure that no one is unsafe at work? And I'm thinking here of perhaps uh, vulnerable groups or BAME workers who, who uh, might feel particularly at risk um, about returning to the workplace. Yeah, I think there's, there's a key thing here is that we have to remember that a risk assessment is a process. The risk assessment is actually to get you to a point of being able to manage those risks. And the most critical thing in any walk of health and safety, be it COVID or be it um, things we're more used to, it is about management of risk that we really put it into place. If you've done your risk assessment well, if the workplace risk assessment is comprehensive, it should already acknowledge that there are groups that are more vulnerable um, for whatever reason, whatever characteristic that may be. And if you're applying those principles well, then all of those groups will be protected. So if you are considering a vulnerable group, you perhaps will have to look and think we need to be even more stringent because all the social distancing um, guidance and the, the cleanliness guidance says we recognise people can't always be two metres apart and very short durations when people pass and so on. That's not so critical for the majority of us. But there may be occasions with a vulnerable group that you think, I need to be even more stringent in applying this, in monitoring it in the workplace, in making sure my workforce are actually following those instructions and that guidance. And I think one of the most critical ones that will is too easily overlooked is the importance of cleanliness and hygiene. So when we start talking about improving cleaning regimes to help manage this risk, um, encouraging workers to wash their hands more frequently, that's the one that's too easy to overlook. So I'd say, you know, if there was anything, make sure that bit gets extra special attention, particularly for those vulnerable groups. Really important advice there. Thank you, Rick. Um, so you may have noticed, uh, viewers, that in the chat panel, uh, my colleague Alice has posted a couple of links to some TUC guidance on um, risk assessments and return to safe workplaces. So very much from the, the workplace reps point of view, the health and safety rep. And we also have a website, um, a TC website called COVID Secure Check, um, where you can post your employer's risk assessment and share it with others. You can also see what other employers are doing. So do check out those links. Um, she's posted them in the chat. So if you can't see them straight away, you might just need to scroll up a little bit. Okay, um, our next question for Rick is uh, is about, as we mentioned earlier, lots of people have been working from home and many people will continue to work from home. So what should employers be doing to ensure the safety of those who will still be doing that, even when they may have some uh, employees who are in the, work, in the workplace, but some may be at home? 
Okay, I think it's a really interesting challenge for a lot of businesses because they've not had to do this before. But if someone is working at home, they are still at work. And while the early days of going into lockdown and people starting to work in this way, we could look at it and say, this is a sort of temporary arrangement people are making do. We have to start thinking about, are they properly equipped to be able to work at home? Have they got the right sort of workspace? And how can we help and advise and guide them in what they need to do? So in just the same way as you would in an office, offering people the right training on setting up their workstation, seeing if they, you can help them um, understand what makes a good working space. But I think really important is to understand that everybody's household will be different and some people might be really lucky and have all the sort of equipment and space they need to be as productive as if they're in the office but for a lot of people they may struggle they might have small children at home because schools have been closed uh, they might not have space they might be trying to work on a kitchen table and you can't expect people to be as 100 percent productive as they were in your well-designed workspace so i think that's one of the really key aspects is understanding how people work and being able to give them the flexibility to do what they can and give them that guidance i think another important thing for any employer is to recognize that a lot of people will be under feeling sort of stress and strain of not being in a workplace they might be feeling isolated might be feeling very remote from their colleagues so we have to start thinking about mental health as well and how do we check in with people? How do we keep that contact that happens so naturally when you're in the same building? We now have to do that more remotely. So you might look at it about how team leaders and managers start having more daily conversations with people, see what they're doing, see how they are, keep an eye on what works coming in so you've got an indicator of whether or not they're managing. So it's quite a complex blend, but I think yeah, we've now had three, three and a half months experience of this. And I'd hope a lot of people have really learned and, and taken their way through that journey to make this quite effective. Thank you for bringing the mental health aspect of um, of well, this whole situation up, really, because yeah, that was one of my later questions. So it's great that we've covered that. Um, so what is your advice for workplace reps if they don't think that their employer is keeping staff safe? Um, let's assume that we're back in the workplace and um, what can they do in that situation? Okay, I think the, the first thing always I, advice I'd give to any workplace rep is talk to your employer, talk to your managers. You know, a conversation is always the starting point. If you don't think something's right, if you've got guidance to refer to so you can actually discuss it with your employer and with managers, team leaders, actually go through it and say, look, I don't think we're doing this well. So cooperation is always the, the backbone of a safe work space. Good engagement between an employer and employees is absolutely critical. Obviously, um, we recognise as the regulator that not all employers get it right and not all as, as cooperative as we might like them to be. The backstop is that you have the ways of raising that either with HSE or with your local authority, raise it as a concern so that we can intervene. But you'd always like to think that that becomes the last resort because a good, well-meaning employer would be willing to talk and discuss it. Thanks, Rick. Um, so thinking about um, the challenges that, that reps might face um, over the coming weeks and months, because as you mentioned earlier, this is a completely unprecedented situation. We can't really compare it to anything that, that any of us have experienced before. So what do you think will be the biggest challenges that reps can expect over the next few weeks in terms of health and safety at work? And perhaps um, what are some ways that they can mitigate those challenges? I think there's, there's going to be a couple of things. I mean, the, the one that will be front and centre of people's mind, obviously, is the COVID precautions. When we go back into a workplace, what has changed and how are we going to work in that new sort of environment where things might be very different from when we were last there? And there is a risk over a period of time that you become complacent 
and you start drifting back to previous working patterns. So if a workplace has been redesigned so that people walk in a one-way system or keep you know, the two meters separation, it's so easy to forget how important that is and start drifting back to how we used to work and circulate around that workplace. So I think that's a big challenge is making sure we keep that focus. There will also be over a period of time changes in government guidance because everything that's been published now is based on everything we know and the circumstances as they are at the moment. And that will keep getting revised as the situation eases, as prevalence in the community goes down or goes up. There might be changes there that have to be reacted to quite quickly. So I think that's the next set of challenges is working with an employer, helping them implement those changes and, and make sure they're working effectively. I think the other one that we shouldn't lose sight of um, is all the risks that used to be there are still there. So just because we've come back and we're really focused on COVID precautions shouldn't detract from the fact that if you have a water system, you might still need good Legionella control. If you've got other processing processes that generate dust and health issues, you've still got to control those. So while we've redesigned everything else for our public health reasons, let's not forget about all the things that were always there anyway and the good health and safety management that goes with it. Yeah, absolutely. I think you um, alluded to this in your intro uh, that COVID isn't the only um, it is certainly the biggest, but it's certainly not the only um, health and safety issue for uh, workplaces, for reps. Um, but it's going to be, uh, I think, a balancing act, isn't it, of, of making sure that all those of all those things that uh, still need to be considered and not just COVID, they can't just be forgotten about. Um, OK, I'm going to take a look at some of the questions that have come in. We've had a huge number. Let me just have a quick look and see. Um, what we've what we've got and see if we can what questions we can pull out here um have you got any advice for um those employees who might be in a vulnerable category but who might be um feeling pressured to return to the workplace um when they when they're in that category okay i think this is going to be a challenge for a lot of people and um, particularly as the government guidelines on those vulnerable groups and the clinically extremely vulnerable they start easing and so we can get back into circulation and back into work there is no reason at all that workplaces can't be made safe for those individuals so the guidelines and the, the advice on distancing and hygiene and putting other mitigation in place is really important and for those individuals going back and feeling concerned about their own health or indeed if a member of your family is in that category and you're concerned you might be contracting COVID at work and taking it back home you should be looking that all of those precautions are there and are well followed and that helps you know with your colleagues with your management and with your employer to actually talk and discuss how that's going to work for you as an in vulnerable individual or a member of a family that's in that way but I think the assurance should be that if the precautions are put in place that person can be as safe in the workplace as they are at home. Thank you um, we had a really interesting question here about um, a conflict between health and safety control measures so for example um, fire doors propped, propped open to avoid Covid contamination COVID contamination or um, obviously if fire doors are propped open it negates their function as a fire door um, so what happens in those situations where there's a conflict? I think this is where we come to the uh, how well do you have to redesign your job or your workplace so you're absolutely right fire doors have a very particular function if they are also a means of having to go in and out of the building um, propping them open to avoid lots of hand contact is then a problem for the fire risk. So perhaps the solution there isn't to prop them open, but it's to have some really stringent cleaning processes. Now, if you can't manage that, 
you can get to the point with, you know, do you actually change your fire door so they have an automatic system that holds them open and is linked in with a fire alarm system? It's going to depend on your workplace and the complexity of it. We could be dealing with very simple workplaces with one or two people there, where actually cleaning is the easy option. You could be dealing with really large workplaces with hundreds of employees where keeping them open is a good option and you need to invest in those better systems that will automatically close them. So there isn't going to be a simple answer to that because like any other risk assessment, you have to look at the context of the premises and the business and how all those different possibilities fit together. And I think that's why risk assessment and guidance will always say, here's the things for you to consider. And then you have to make your decision based on what works best in that particular environment. Um, yeah, thank you for that. It's uh, like you said, each individual situation is um, has to be considered in its own in its own uh, way. Um, someone has, has put in the chat that they, you can use a kick bar on fire doors, perhaps um, as a as a way to that will mean that people aren't touching it. That's a possible idea. That's great to see a suggestion there from a viewer. Um, we've had quite a few questions that all um, that they're all quite specific, but they're all asking about the role of the HSE and what the HSE could do in uh, some of these situations. So could you talk about perhaps uh, what the HSE's role might be if a employer is um, not making workplaces safe or if they are, I know we covered this a little bit earlier, but um, how the HSC could hold employers to account in extreme situations or in situations where workers feel that um, they're, not, they're not being kept safe from COVID? Yeah. I certainly can. And I think the other thing I just ask viewers to keep in mind is that HSE is the regulator for probably about half of the workplaces in the country and the local authorities regulate the other half. So offices, warehouses and so on are regulated by local authority. But effectively, the role is the same and how we would react is the same. So this is a really unique situation where you have what is a public health risk that is present in the workplace and we're putting in precautions that are under the management and control of an employer. So we're treating it under the Health and Safety at Work Act in much the same way as any other risks within the business. And that means HSE's function is the same here as it would be for any other business risk. Um, if we were looking at a workplace, um, we would be making an assessment of how well they control those risks. In this situation, how well are they applying the guidance um, for distancing, cleanliness, other mitigations to reduce the chance of COVID? And then from that, if we find there are shortcomings, it depends how serious they are as to what action. Ultimately, our aim is always to get things put right. So it's about a conversation with a duty holder to help them understand. It's about giving advice and guidance of how they can implement things. Um, and that is always, you know, the starting point. Ultimately, as a regulator, we do have a role in enforcement. And if conditions were very bad and nothing had been put in place and there was no cooperation from that employer, we could be in a situation of serving enforcement notices to get improvement. But ultimately, this is about getting the safety for the workforce and getting that measured. So our role here is much the same as it is with any other workplace risk, is make a judgment of the quality of risk control within that business. And if it is lacking, take some action to get it corrected. You're still on mute, Anna. I am. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you for that uh, answer and for pointing out no one could hear me. So um, we've had quite a few questions from uh, people who work in schools. Um, there's a lot of very specific situations been described, um, and I'm just going to try and summarise some of them because we won't be able to answer every single question, I'm afraid, but I'm going to do my best to summarise them. Um, schools are maybe a, a very particular type of workplace in that there are children 
uh, as we know, May, maybe many of whom won't be able to social distance. Um, it's a kind of maybe quite unusual situation. Do you have any advice for these particular workplaces that are um, all going to be back in September, as we, we've seen, uh, schools are all going to be returning. Um, but for the unusual and maybe unique uh, situation that anyone who works as a school finds themselves in okay it's going to be as you say an interesting challenge and not least of all because we are looking two three months into the future and what we don't know at the moment is what the relative level of risk is going to be in terms of what's the prevalence of covid in society and that changes over time and that changes the level of risk that we're all facing. So that's that's an interesting bit and makes it very hard to be definitive. What I can say is that people within my team are working with the Department of Education on their guidance for how schools can operate. Um, it's something that we've been commenting on just this week, so I can't even get into the detail of it yet. But things are being put in place there to help those schools manage the risks. Um, I think you're right, there will be challenges as to how well those schools can adapt to help control the behaviour of children, um, what they can do to control group sizes, distancing and so on. I can speak from personal experience that I have a teenage daughter who's spent some time in school in the last couple of weeks where under current circumstances they've had very small group sizes um, they've had an adult um, chaperoning those pupils to make sure they're staying separate they've controlled contact with other groups so they've kept them in a small cohort and ultimately we recognize that minimizes and reduces the likelihood of transmission um, so from there that's one experience of where we are at the moment and as i said what will happen in september when prevalence and so on is very different i think that's going to be hard to understand uh, until we get a bit closer the guidance will be coming out and it will help address that and i think it will take time for people to understand it and apply it in their particular setting uh, and that will be again the challenge of taking that and converting it to a risk assessment that suits that school Uh, thanks, Rick. Um, so I'm just looking at the other questions. So so many are coming in, and they're kind of moving around on the list. So it's hard to see what I've always what I've already covered. Um, we've had a number of questions as well about uh, BAME groups. I know we covered this briefly earlier, um, but there's. Uh, sorry, just one second. Um, with regard to um, BAME workers and the maybe particular risk that they face with COVID-19, um, and we know we, we've already covered that um, this can be covered in a risk assessment, but is there anything else that uh, the HSC and employers can do to, um, and, and union reps actually, to, can do to um, enforce this, to help these, these colleagues um, and these workers feel safe? Okay, you're right. We, we did touch on this when I talked about vulnerable groups. And I think there's some real issues that we are looking at around BAME. Um, you, obviously, there's the Public Health England um, report that came out that sort of shone a light on the disparity of the impact on these communities. And part of the challenge we have is understanding that so there is a, a committee called SAGE, which is the Science Advisory Group for Emergencies. And they commissioned um, a working group that consists of Public Health England, HSE, and the Faculty of Occupational Medicine, plus a few other topic experts to actually look at this and come up with strategies of how to deal with this particular challenge. Um, I actually sit on that group with a couple of HSE colleagues, and we've only formed and met within the last couple of weeks so it is work in progress so what i would say is currently where we look at these groups that appear to be higher risk then the guidance is there and the advice we're giving is follow that guidance and follow it stringently make sure it's applied and applied well 
over the next few weeks as that working group progresses and looks more deeply at this topic if there are any changes coming from that it will be fed back into that national guidance so it's a case of keeping up with any changes to the guidance in case things need to be done differently so at the moment everything as written do it well keep on top of it if things change be ready to respond thank you um so we've had an interesting question here about um how people who are shielding and guidance around shielding has varied throughout the pandemic um it's not it's not perhaps been always uh, consistent um so some might some our question asks, uh, not everyone fits all the boxes, but may have significant health issues. Um, would the HSC recommend occupational health assessments for those in the shielding category who might be concerned about returning to work, um, bearing in mind that we, um, we are perhaps expecting further outbreaks on a localised level or a national level, um, and these people might be at risk not just from returning to work, but their journey to the workplace okay i again i think it's very difficult to give an individual answer on this because every workplace is different and every individual has um different circumstances so the overarching one was the people that we refer to as shielded and also refer to as clinically extremely vulnerable um that is a very particular group of people that were written to have a call it an nhs letter to say this is this is your category and this is why you need to be extra cautious um as i said earlier for that group of people if all of the controls are put in place properly in the workplace then there's no reason that they can't work safely it may be that an employer needs to change the work they do give them something different so you know can they be given a different space to work in a different tasks perhaps to help keep them more distant from their colleagues in terms of travel to work normally we would look at that and say this isn't actually an employer's responsibility but they may consider that there are things they can do to support that individual so you know for example if that person could drive to work they normally use public transport is an employer able to give them a car parking space to help facilitate uh, a journey where they can travel alone rather than using public transport? Um, you know, what other things might they be able to help and advise? And of course, we still have the overarching one where all the advice at the moment says, if you can work at home, work at home. So you could have an employer that says, normally I would need that person in the workplace I can give them different work that they can do at home and they can continue to do so even when we're getting the work for workplace open for other activities. So as I say, unfortunately, not an easy answer. It's going to have to be looked at almost case by case and business by business to decide what's best for that workforce and how you can help and support them. Thanks, Rick. Um, so kind of linked to that question because it's about transport. Um, have you got any advice that can be given to non-key workers who are being forced to return to the workplace, but they have to use public transport? Um, and as you just mentioned, um, it's still generally against government advice to use public transport. And um, there's quite a healthy discussion in the chat about, about this. And if you've got any advice for this particular situation? Yeah, again, as you said the, the, the main advice is if you can avoid using public transport please do so um the whole thing around coronavirus and managing the spread of it and reducing the spread is about keeping people apart and so if we all pack into public transport um obviously the the uh, potential for transmission gets greater you could look at that and say if an employer was able to stagger the time they expected someone to come in they may be able to get the train or the bus um, a, li a little later or a little earlier so that there's not so many passengers. That may be an option. Um, the guidance uh, said, you know, if there are other ways of traveling to work, perhaps they should find those. It isn't, there isn't an easy one because everybody's journey will be different. 
some people will say the only way I can get to work is by public transport, in which case they need to follow the guidance um, that's been produced specifically for that um, about how the transport operators will operate the buses, coaches and so on. Thanks for that, Rick. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the importance of cleanliness and hygiene and about how that is going to be quite key um, throughout as long as COVID is still with us. Um, so what would you advise the protocol should be if um, the workplace is unable to get the cleaning equipment or the correct PPE required in order to make this uh, the workplace safe? Right, if you look at the current guidance, um, PPE is generally not required if all the other precautions are put in place. So PPE shouldn't be a limiting factor for work for workplaces if they've put all the others in place. When it comes to the cleanliness side of it, um, a lot of it is about the personal cleanliness, so frequent washing of hands, because a lot of the transmission of this virus is actually from contact with your hands and then touching your own face, uh, rubbing your eyes and that sort of um, action. And that is a really difficult one, but it is one for each and every one of us to actually look at our own behaviours and what we do. Um, if you actually think about how often you might touch your face without even realising it, it becomes really challenging. So there's that side of it. Um, an employer should be able to provide um, the right sort of facilities, running water, soap, towels and so on. That's a basic requirement anyway of any workplace. Um, so it's that sort of help and reminder. I think the, the other point there you've made is about actually cleaning surfaces and so on. And generally the normal cleaning products should be available. The, the real challenge is making sure you get the frequency of cleaning right. Um, you know, it's not a once a day, it's not a twice a day. It's how big is your workforce? How often do they touch that panel on the door or that touch point on a turnstile and how much extra cleaning you might have to put in just to help with that um, reduction of transmission. Mute again. I was on mute. Uh, thank you. Um, so I think we've probably got time for two or three more questions. Uh, we've had an unbelievably large amount and I've tried to um, theme them where I can. So um, We've got one here about the union role. Perhaps this is something that you, you can advise. What can reps do or unions do to enforce uh, the legislation? Um, sorry, the question has just disappeared again. Uh, to enforce the legislation in workplaces if they think that a um, an employer is breaching them. Yeah, I think it, this lapse back into the question you asked before about you know what what do we do if the employer doesn't appear to be doing it and as i said the first point of call is always about conversation with management um you know raise it discuss it go through the guidance together work through it to show where the concerns are and what those problems may be and you know our experience of of workplaces it, particularly where there is good relationships between a union um and management is that is normally all it takes to get things corrected, get things to a, a situation that everybody um, is satisfied with. And I say, ultimately, if that fails and there are still shortcomings that aren't being resolved, then the backstop is contacting HSE or the local authority. Yes, and of course, like, uh, like you mentioned earlier, it depends on your sector um, as to which um, agency you contact, HSE or your local authority. Um, okay, we've got a question here about um, very often in larger workplaces, there are a number of first aiders that are part of the workforce. Um, are there any guidance for these particular first aiders? Should they have PPE bearing in mind their role um, and that things have now changed since we've got COVID? Um, I can't tell you the exact details of the guidance, but I can tell you HSE did update its guidance on first aid um, and first aid provisions. So 
if you look on the HSE website at the COVID pages, there is updated guidance for first aiders there. Thanks. And I think, um, so time has absolutely flown by, but we've got another question that uh, does link back to enforcement that you've touched on a few times. Um, and be it whether it's a local authority or, or yourselves, um, and you, we've mentioned that we're not, it's not just COVID in the workplace, there's all the other health and safety risks that were around before, and we can't just ignore those. Um, but how realistic is it for, um, for for both the local authority and you to be able to, um, you know, bearing in mind we're all under pressure, how realistic are you, is it going to be able to for you to enforce this and uh, make sure all the other health and safety requirements are being met given, um, you know, the resources that you have and the, perhaps the resources that you've lost recently? Um, I think we're in a, a solid position to be able to do so and i think what you have to remember is that being able to get good compliance isn't just about inspectors being able to to visit premises that is just part of an overall toolbox that a regulator uses so first and foremost we have government level and hse level um, information that's published advice guidance is available and a lot of employers will go to that and will be doing everything they can to comply with it. We also have ways of contacting workplaces to check what they're doing, you know, and if we follow up, for example, on a concern that's raised, it may be that we actually just phone up and say, we've been told that the situation is X. Can you explain it? Can you demonstrate it? Can you send us a picture to show what you've done? Um, and sometimes that's enough to get things done. And that's enough to get changes so you can work through all of those and then ultimately yes if there are things that are of a high level of concern and we don't believe they're being addressed then we can have an inspector go and visit um, and actually take more direct action so there's a sort of as i said i've described it as a toolbox there's a blend of approaches we can use to get compliance and at the back of all of this the vast majority of employers do want to keep their workforce safe they do want to do the right thing and so often it just needs some help and direction to get them there thanks your advice would still be to um to contact the relevant enforcement agency um and often it would be a, a nudge um and then you'll be able to um follow that up if changes aren't made at that point yeah if as i said the, the ideal is that there's cooperation between the workers and the employer and that is what brings about the best and the most lasting change but you know where that's not working that is part of our role as a regulator is to be able to look into it okay um Thanks for that, Rick. We've we've covered an awful lot in the time that we've had. Um, I'm just noticing lots of links suddenly going into the chat panel, um, and we will be sending these round to uh, everyone who's registered after the webinar. So don't don't worry. We we always collate them and make sure uh, make sure we get them out to you. Um, so um, I've just let uh, Rick sum up just uh, some concluding words before um, before we, we finish this week's webinar. Okay, um, I think if I was to sort of give some general advice to union reps and workers, I think it is about maintaining those good relationships with your employer working collaboratively, you know, working cooperatively, because uh, this is a challenge that we all have to face together. And it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Um, really, really good questions. And I've been watching what's coming up in the chat link as well. Um, I'm good. To see, it's good to see that level of involvement. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming on um, and doing this webinar for us. Um, it just leaves me to thank everybody who's joined. It's great to see so many of you tune in. Uh, we'll be back soon for uh, more webinars. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head what the next one is, but uh, there is one, not next week, the week after, because next week it's the TUC's uh, organized 2020 Festival of Ideas. Um, we have a three-day online uh, 
series of online sessions, uh, Thursday the 9th, Friday the 10th, and Saturday the 11th of July. Um, I think Shelley posted some links uh, to the health and safety sessions further up in the chat. Uh, so please do check that out. Uh, lots of people are saying that Alice has been a complete star today in the chat. She's posted numerous links. So great job. Uh, great job, Alice. So thanks, everybody. And we'll see you again soon for another key webinar um, on union issues. Bye bye for now. <laughs>